Now it's my uh, my pleasure to uh, turn to Congressman Seth Moulton. Congressman Moulton proudly represents Massachusetts's sixth district. Prior to this uh, and serving in Congress, he served four tours in the Marines and led the building of America's first high speed rail line. Uh, Congressman Moulton uh, was also a leader in the creation of the 988 National Suicide Lifeline, now in all 50 states, as we know, and a very, very important achievement for the congressman, for this Congress, and for this president. Uh, he's also, uh, of course, a leader in Congress in expanding mental health care access in this country. Uh, we've been working closely, just on a personal level, we've been working very closely with Congressman Moulton's um, office uh, on a whole range of ideas um, around social isolation and loneliness. And what I'll say is the way that he's starting to think about this issue and that you'll hear about uh, is sort of, a, I think, a new sort of community-based approach uh, in the Congress on a bipartisan basis. So uh, really excited to have him with us today. So let's give him a warm welcome. Congressman Moulton. Thanks so much for joining us. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, for having me. Thank you, Andrew, for the kind introduction and for all the good work that you, Patrick, and everyone else on your team is doing. I'm here to talk about resilience and what we can do to strengthen resilience, even through a little bit of legislation here in America. Now, I just returned a few days ago from the D-Day celebrations in Normandy, the 80th anniversary, perhaps the last anniversary where any significant number of actual World War II veterans will attend. We flew overnight to get there, uh, got to the hotel in Paris about four in the morning, left an hour later at five, um, took about four or five hours to get out to, to Normandy, uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. Actually, we didn't do trains. That would have been a lot faster, but planes and automobiles. And... Um, and as we were walking into the celebration, uh, I turned to a colleague and just said, hey, how's it going? And he said, uh, well, it's OK, I'm a little tired. And my immediate reaction to him there for the 80th anniversary of D-Day was, oh, no, no, you don't get to be tired. Not here. Not today. You don't get to be tired. The point is that. We all have times when we have to be resilient, whether you're scaling the cliffs on Omaha Beach or you're just showing up as a member of Congress to be there for a commemoration. For me, one of the times that comes to mind when I think about resilience in my own life is in 2019 when I made one of the biggest decisions of my political career. And that wasn't running for president, although I did that as well. There were 25 other Democrats running for president, and I doubt there's anyone in this room who remembers that I was one of them. No, my decision did not put me in a group of 25. It put me in a group of one, becoming the first sitting member of Congress ever to talk about dealing with my own mental health issues. This was my biggest political secret, my one skeleton in the closet, as they say, that I never even told my own team. Not only did I experience some symptoms of post-traumatic stress after serving four tours as a Marine infantry officer in Iraq, but I made the audacious decision to actually seek help for it, to go talk to a therapist. Now, these things not only having a mental health issue, but actually getting help for it, have been death sentences in American politics for literally centuries. And this even despite the fact that we know some of our greatest American political leaders dealt with mental health issues themselves. Abraham Lincoln had a lifelong issues with depression. If you read what George H.W. Bush or John F. Kennedy wrote about their experiences in World War II, they almost certainly suffered symptoms of post-traumatic stress as well. But nonetheless, there's a long sordid history of people being drummed out of politics because of revelations about their personal mental health. So I knew that sharing my story could literally end my career. But I also thought about all the Marines I had served with, whom I had been encouraging to share their own stories 
and get help. Marines lead by example. And I wasn't leading by example by keeping this part of my own life a secret. Of course, I was afraid that my entire community, my community of supporters, might abandon me, like so many have run from have run from pull-up politicians for actual real scandals in the past. But much to my surprise, they didn't. Not only did they not abandon me, they encouraged me. And their presence in my life made me even more resilient than I had been before. Now, I know that most Americans don't experience loneliness in the form of going way out on a limb as a member of Congress. But this same feeling, this feeling of loneliness, being alone, alone with a certain experience or revelation is something that every one of us will go through at some point in our lives. What we need to do is not avoid doing hard things. They will happen, and good people will take on tough challenges. What we don't need is more safe spaces. What we need is resiliency, resiliency in the face of challenges. The Marines helped make me resistant, resilient. The men and women I served with still do today. And so did growing up in my own little hometown of Marblehead, Massachusetts, a small town with a big sense of community. I was also fortunate to find some strong mentors in both high school and college. All of these things have helped sustain me in times of adversity. And while I wouldn't say that serving in Congress is the best place to go if you want to preserve your mental health, I do have strong communities in Washington and back home. I mean, even the internet trolls and extremists do their own part. Uh, I actually screenshot some of the most awful posts they make and try to laugh about them later. Um, I'll, I'll save some of the quotes for offline. The Marine Corps has an age-old saying, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. I try to take that to heart. But more important than my personal experience with this disclosure about my own mental health was the fact that it gave me a platform, a platform I use today to make mental health a national policy priority in Congress. Back in 2019, around the same time as I was talking about my post-traumatic stress experience, I also established a three-point mental health plan. I'm proud to say we've made a lot of progress in accomplishing two of those three pillars so far. First, getting troops and veterans better mental health care, not just because they deserve it, but because they can set a great example for everyone else in the country. If that Green Beret or U.S. Marine is willing to get mental health care, talk to a therapist, I can too. Creating a three-digit mental health hotline, I co-authored the bill to establish 988, and it's literally saved thousands of lives already. But the third, thanks. Thank you. But the third point is harder. It's to completely normalize mental health care by establishing annual mental health checkups the same way we have annual physicals. Because if I told you I was on my way to an annual physical this afternoon, no one would come up to me after this speech and say, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? But that probably wouldn't be what people are thinking if I told you I was going to go see a therapist as soon as this was done. We've got to get to the point where we totally normalize mental health care, routine mental health care in America. Make it preventative care, not just reaction to, to crisis. It's since, since become evident, thanks to the work that you are all doing, that there's another underappreciated factor plaguing our mental and physical health, and, and that's loneliness. We've all seen that dramatic formulation that found lack of social connection can be as dangerous as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day, uh, and not as fun either for anyone who's had a cigarette. And loneliness costs employers about $154 billion annually. People are politically divided because they're more isolated than ever, stuck in information bubbles and in front of screens. Too many Americans wake up every day unhappy. Now, I'm not saying that we can just legislate away all loneliness, but we can provide the tools for every American to build happy, connected, and resilient lives, to confront what we know to be the main causes of loneliness and isolation in America today. So how do we do that? 
I'm working on a new bill, something I'm calling the Resilient Act, which will begin to build the foundations for a whole of society effort to combat the epidemic of social isolation. We're still building out the legislation, but I'm glad to share a preview of it today. And we'd really like to hear your suggestions from the experts in this room about how we can improve it and make it better. What we wanna do is create a new playbook rooted in a few different pillars. Number one is the built environment. This means incentivizing the construction of an environment that fosters social connections. There's real social and societal value to green spaces, to bingo halls, VFW halls, pedestrian malls, plazas, neighborhood barbershops, or the community swimming pool. It's that first place where you went as a kid without your parents, where maybe you got into it with a bully, but your friends stood up for you. This means incentivizing cities and towns, nonprofits and businesses to build infrastructure geared toward livability and social interaction that gets people away from their screens, out of their cars and into the community. And if we're going to encourage people to participate in their communities, we'll need safer and more orderly public spaces to do so. And that means better community policing. So this legislation will increase grant funding for public safety to improve public spaces and make them more friendly, safe, and accessible. Americans should live, work, and play in places designed for humans, not for cars. These investments are not just good for business and overall economic vitality. Studies also show that more social cohesion prepares communities better for moments of crisis, like national disasters or pandemics. The next pillar is seniors. Getting older in America shouldn't mean losing a sense of purpose and connection. This legislation will have provisions in it that aim to build better quality of life for seniors, like incentivizing mixed use community living and funding intergenerational facilities such as community centers and combined daycare senior centers. More connected seniors mean a healthier economy. It means not spending an extra $6.7 billion a year on healthcare for socially isolated older adults. And finally, the third pillar will be youth and social media. The bottom line is that we need to figure out a way to get kids off their phones and back into real life with their families, their friends, and their school communities. That means prohibiting kids from being on their phones during the school day. It means finally holding social medias, media companies to account, putting time limits for kids and finding platforms who violate them. And instead, expanding youth national service after school programs and cultural enrichment opportunities for kids to see their country, not through their phones, but in person. Our younger generations need to be prepared to face a tough world, to fix problems, to take on the challenges that we know are all around us. And we as adults, as leaders, need to create better conditions for young people to thrive. That involves making tough choices. In the world of public policy, there has never been a meaningful investment in our kids that didn't pay off in huge dividends. This crisis of social isolation, at the end of the day, doesn't have a simple fix because it has been compounded for years upon years and has profoundly deep roots. It touches everyone and has many causes. And that's why what I'm proposing today is that we think big, come up with new outside the box ideas and go bold. Telling my story about post-traumatic stress has made me stronger. It's helped me become a better congressman, a better father, a better citizen, a better friend. We need more Americans to have that experience as well, taking on tough things, whether by choice or by accident. And rather than shrinking from the challenge, seeing it through. We can make America better, stronger, more resilient. And I'd love to do it with you. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about my own experience and give you a preview about some of the work that I think we can do in partnership to make a better, stronger country. Thank you very much.